All right, in this video, we are starting our logic units. And in this first video, we're really going to talk about a lot of the vocabulary that you need in order to um, look at problems in a logical manner. So this video, make sure you take good notes on the vocabulary. I'm going to be using that quite a bit. And, um, and then please ask questions about this, because this is very new to you. And please ask questions in class if you don't understand some of the vocabulary. So here's an example. Given that points A, B, and C are collinear, and B is between A and C, Steve made a conjecture that B is the midpoint of C. So first thing I want to talk about, a conjecture. All that is, is an educated guess. And a conjecture could be right or wrong, but if it's right, it has to always be right. And the only thing you need to do to prove someone wrong is to give one single counterexample, and that proves that it's not always right. So determine if this conjecture is true or false. So could we have A, B, and C collinear, and B is between A and C, and B is not the midpoint? Absolutely. Right? We could have a segment that looks like that. So that would be our counterexample showing that Steve's conjecture is false. So let's look at conditional statements. We're going to be using conditional statements quite a bit in this chapter. So a conditional statement is simply a logical statement and it has two parts, a hypothesis and a conclusion. Okay, so in a conditional statement is usually made in an if-then statement. Okay, so usually it would say if blah blah blah, then blah blah blah. Symbolically, the conditional involving P and Q is written like this. So we'll be we'll be talking about P's and Q's more in depth later, but you might see a conditional statement written like that. Or in words, it might it'll be read if P then Q. Or another way you can read that is P implies Q. And then um, like I said, the truth of it we'll evaluate later in another video. The important part you need to know right now is that in an if-then statement and a conditional statement, the hypothesis is whatever comes after the if, and the conclusion is what comes after the then part. So written in if-then form, if I study hard, then I will pass geometry. So here's my hypothesis, if I study hard then I will pass geometry. That's my conclusion. So let's take these normal statements. They're not written in, in conditional form. We're going to take them and write them in if-then form. So all monkeys have tails. All right, so that would be if an animal is a monkey, You can see how I had to kind of elaborate on that statement a little bit. Then it has a tail. And again, right now we're not going to look at is this true or false. We're just um, look, trying to rewrite things in if-then form. So we get practice using that. I will pass geometry by studying hard. All right, so this is just like the one we just did. If I study hard, then I will pass geometry. This one was a little different because it we had to flip-flop the order, right? It's a lot of people think, if I pass geometry, then I'm studying hard. So it's really because of the English, by studying hard, that's our, that's our thing that has to come first. That's what we mean by that. Parallel lines do not intersect. All right, so we have to say if, what do we have? So what's the condition? If lines are parallel, then, then what happens? Then they do not intersect. That's how we can change normal statements that we were used to seeing into if-then um, conditional form. 
And the conditional form is useful because we can analyze it logically with different tools. All right, so this is what we were talking about before. Conditional statements can be true or false. To be true, you must have the conclusion is true every time the hypothesis is true. All right, and then the only way, the only thing you need to do to show something is false is to provide one counterexample. And we did that with Steve's conjecture and the collinear. Okay, so now let's talk about what can we do with conditional statements. Well, we can have what we call the negation of a statement, and that's simply the opposite of the original statement. Okay, so notice that here I'm not even talking about if-then form. My statement one is the ball is red, so the negation is the ball is not red. Okay, so you're just doing the complete opposite. Here's another example. Jedi Masters do not use lightsabers. This is the original statement, so the negation of that would be the masters do not not use. So another words of saying that is they do. So they do use lightsabers. That was what would be the negation of that. So just keep in mind, it's not always just putting not in front of something. Sometimes it makes more sense just to use the positive uh, version of that. So let's look at some conditional statements and how they relate to other kinds of statements. So here's my conditional statement. If Mrs. McCahan is my teacher, then I go to Park Way North. All right, so is that true? <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you have me as a teacher, this is the only place I teach, so that is true. You can't think of a counterexample. All right, so like if I maybe taught at a college or something like that, then we could say that that's false. But in this situation, that is true. All right, so then let's talk about the converse. The converse of a conditional statement is formed when we switch the hypothesis and the conclusion. So if I'm using this statement, I would say if, now instead of saying Ms. McCain is my teacher, I would say if I go to part P and H, then, Mrs. McCann is my teacher. I'm running out of room. Okay, so that's the converse. So we switched it. And again, this converse could be true or false. So can you think of a counterexample? So if you go to PNH, then Mrs. McCann is my teacher. Well, absolutely. I can think of um, many freshmen who don't have me as their math teacher, and they still go to Parkway North. So this is false, and that was my counterexample. So I just proved it false. Now we also have what we call an inverse. Inverse is formed when you negate the hypothesis and the conclusion of the original conditional statement. So I'm going to go back to my original one, and I'm going to um, do the opposites of both the hypothesis and the conclusion. So that would say if... Mrs. McCahan is not my teacher, then I do not go to PNH. So that's the inverse, and that's what that looks like. I, all I did was put not in front of each part, the hypothesis and the conclusion. So is this true? Um, can you think of someone who does not have me and that does go to P Parkway North? Yeah, um, there's lots of people that do not have me and go to Parkway North, so there are many counterexamples to that one. So that, again, is false. And then contrapositive. This is when we negate the hypothesis and conclusion of the converse. So not only am I going to negate everything, I'm also going to switch the hypothesis and conclusion. So I'm switching and negating. So that would look like, if I look at this converse, if I do not go to PNH, then Mrs. McCahan is not my teacher.
that is what we consider contrapositive. So if I do not go to P and H, so think of people who do not go to P and H, then Mrs. McCann is not my teacher. So is there anyone that doesn't go to Parkway North but all, still has me as a teacher? No, I, I've already said that I don't teach anywhere else. So this is true. This will always be true. I can't find a counterexample. So each of these can be true or false, and that's why we were just going through all that. Now here's what I want you to notice about these. Con the conditional statement, that was the original one, and the contrapositive were both true, right? And that will always be the case. Either they will both be true or they will both be false. In the same way, did you notice that the converse and the inverse were both false? So the converse and the inverse of a conditional statement are either both true or both false. And in our case, they were both false. All right, so pairs of statements such as these are called equivalent statements. So when two statements are um, either both true or both false, they are equivalent statements. So they're logically equivalent. So it's another way of saying uh, the same meaning or the same outcome. So now let's talk about biconditional statements. Biconditional uses the phrase if and only if. All right, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. So writing the biconditional statement is the same as writing the conditional and the converse. And we did this a, a lot um, with our definitions. Definitions are often written in biconditional because we can write it both forwards and backwards. Do you remember when we were doing our proof cards that we would write a definition in both ways? We would say if, and then we would switch it. That was writing the conditional and the converse. But here's the catch. You can only write a biconditional statement, a, a true biconditional statement, when either, um, when both the converse and the conditional, the statement and its converse are both true or both false. Okay, otherwise that biconditional statement is not valid. All right, so that's why we were only doing it for definitions. Sometimes that's not true going both ways for other things. Some notation that you might want to see, remember how I said um, conditionals will have that P arrow Q? Well, this is going to look like a P double arrow, and we'll talk more about notation in the next video. Um, you will also see something IFF. So it'll say um, lines are parallel if and only if IFF. They never cross. They never intersect. And that is true, right? Because if lines are parallel, then they should never intersect. If lines never intersect, then, then we know they're parallel. Okay, so when you see IFF, that's not if spelled incorrectly. It just means if and only if. So for example, we're going to rewrite this, condition, this biconditional statement as two conditional statements. So an angle is a straight angle if and only if it measures is its measure is 180 degrees. So we've talked about straight angles before. So the conditional statement, if I'm going forward, would be if an angle is a straight angle, then its measure is 180 degrees. So then what would the converse look like? Well, if the measure of an angle is 180 degrees, so now I'm doing that part first, then the angle is a straight angle. So that's how we can break up a biconditional. And you see why we want to use biconditionals, because now we don't have to write both of them. All right, so in the next video, we will talk about symbolic notation and some logical tools.